Hey guys, it's Captain Ace Murray for Game of Thrones Season 5, Episode 4, The Sons of the Harpy. And that was the perfect tone of the episode because, holy shit, the ending was crazy. But this was by far the best episode of the season. So much crazy shit happened in this episode. And uh, let's talk about it because it was amazing. So, we start off with the only scene we see of Tyrion in this episode. Now, I was definitely looking forward to this episode because of the cliffhanger of last week with Tyrion getting captured. I really wasn't sure what was going to happen here. Now, we basically see that this fisherman is unloading his haul until he's knocked down and paid by Jorha. And, of course, Jorha captured Tyrion because he doesn't realize who Tyrion is. And Tyrion struggles unsuccessfully to cut the rope, binding his hands together. Jorha loads Tyrion into the fisherman's ship and shoves off. So, the, what we're going to do with him is unknown right now because that's all we see of Tyrion in this episode. But I thought it was a good way to, I guess, catch up with Tyrion, even though it's the only scene we see of him. I mean, for the only scene we see of him, it was a good scene, I guess. Um... I, I guess it was a good scene. Um, so, Jamie sails toward Dorne, and he sees Tarth, which is Brienne's home in the distance, and below deck, Jamie and Braun are discussing how crazy Dorne is, and Braun doesn't understand why they're on a merchant ship, or why Jamie doesn't just send a fleet, and Jamie says he's gonna rescue his niece, and... Of course, you know, he, he's talking about, um, you know, his daughter, his, uh, you know, um, uh, Cersei's daughter and everything, and basically, Braun says something to let on that he knows about Marcella's true parentage, and Jamie, Jamie says it has to be him that goes to Dorne, and Braun realized that Jamie set Tyrion free, and Jamie says that Tyrion murdered his father, and that if he ever sees Tyrion again, he will split him in two, which I don't really think Jamie would do that. I think Jamie understands why Tyrion did what he did. I think Tyr Jamie's just saying that to justify what he did, and I think that's really what he's doing there. Um, but I like seeing Jamie in this episode. I thought that was well done, and basically, especially because we didn't see him in the last week's episode. That's something I like about Game of Thrones, that the people you don't see in one episode, you'll see them more next week. So at a small council meeting, Cersei and Mace discuss the crown's de um, debt to the Iron Bank of Bravos, and Mace offers to loan the crown more gold, but Cersei says they need to negotiate new terms with the bank in person. She sends Mace on a trip to Bravos, which Sir Marin Trant as guard. So Cersei meets with the High Sparrow, of course, um, basically. She notes that holy men and women have been targeted for attacks, murders, um, palaging, and rape, and Cersei recommends rebuilding the Faith Militant Armed Forces in the service of the Faith, and suggests the High Sparrow to become the new High Septon. Of course, the High Septon was killed, so basically she wants him to become the new High Sparrow, and I think that's really interesting overall. Um, if that's, you know, I think that's really interesting. The sparrows are now the seven-pointed star, now the seven-pointed star carved into their heads, stormed through the streets, and I'm just like, that's terrible because anyone will know who they are. And they are overturning tables and pulling prostitutes into the street. It kind of reminded me of, um, what happened with, like, Holocaust victims. Because if you remember with Holocaust victims, they'd have to wear something to, like, show who they are. Obviously, this is, you know, they don't have, as, we don't have much sympathy for the Sparrows because they're terrible people, but, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting, the discrimination that was against them. So, the gold cloaks in turn a blind eye, and finally they take hold of Loris, and I thought that was really interesting. Now, it makes sense why. Now, I'm kind of thinking that we do have sort of like a Holocaust-esque thing going on because, of course, Loris is gay, and he claims that everyone knows that he is, so if the Sparrows knew, maybe they're not really, you know, for that, so they're going to take him. I mean, that, that was very interesting what was going to happen there. So Marjorie bursts into Toman's room and demands to know why Loris is in his cell, and Toman, of course, he's completely oblivious. He doesn't know why this is happening, and... I'm not saying that Tolman's an idiot. I'm really not because I've heard people say that, you know, Tolman is just too young to be a king. I'd have to agree with that. I mean, Tolman, honestly, let's think about this. Tolman is, like, close to my age. If I was Tolman, I probably wouldn't really give a shit. I really wouldn't. I mean, I'm not the most experienced um, at this job. I'm not the most experienced at this, definitely. I feel like if I were Tolman, I'd do the same thing. So... Basically, Marjorie tries to explain it to him, and he's too naive to understand what's fully going on, and Marjorie regains her composure and tries sweetness instead, and basically is trying to convince, you know, tell him why this is such a bad thing, even though he doesn't simply really understand it fully. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So Tormund bursts, um, Tormund then bursts in on his mother and demands that Loras be free. He very quickly understands what's going on, and Cersei explains that she wasn't the one who arrested him, but Tormund knows that she armed the Faith Militant, and Cersei basically 
basically says if Tolman talks to the High Sparrow, she's sure that Loras will be released. So, I was wondering if Tolman will actually do that because I didn't really know if Tolman cared, but clearly he does care because he goes to the Great Septon. And I mean, the reason he cares, I mean, here's the thing. If it wasn't someone that was related to Marjorie, I don't think he'd care as much because that's Marjorie's brother. Obviously, she's going to be pissed about it, and he loves Marjorie more than anything, so he's going to do whatever he can to try to make sure that, um, you know, the... Uh, to make sure that Loris is okay. So Tommen goes to Great Septon, but is blocked by the Faith Militant. There's a standoff between the Faith Militant and the Kingsguard, and the crowd begins to shout that Tommen's a bastard and an abomination. And I can kind of understand why they said that. I mean, he hasn't really done anything as a king. Really, he hasn't. Um, it's like when you look at a president and they haven't done anything that's just as bad as what Tommen's doing. So he backs down, and he returns and tells Marjorie there was no way to get Loris out without violence. And, of course, Tommen's not really about that. He doesn't want to solve things with violence, and... Marjorie says he's the king, and he let a rabble stop him, and I, I like what Marjorie says here, that he shouldn't, and Marjorie leaves to send more to her grandmother, and I'm kind of worried for Marjorie, honestly. I think that she really did care about him, but now she's seeing that he's like a weak king, and honestly, he's kind of a softy. He is. He definitely is a softy. I mean, he is young, but he is a softy, and in real life, actually, the actor plays Tom, I believe, is like only 15, which I find kind of interesting, um, but... I think it's good that they did that because he's playing the part very well, but Marjorie, you can you can tell that he isn't as good as a king as he should be, and I think definitely he needs to get some sort of training here. I don't really know who can train him, but I really hope this does not affect the relationship because I love these two together. I hope that they don't, you know, split up or anything, but I feel like that's where we're headed because now Marjorie's all pissed at him. I definitely feel like we're headed for maybe a breakup. I really hope that doesn't happen, though. So Stannis and um, Solis discuss Jon Snow, and Stannis doesn't think the stories of Jon's mother being a commoner are true. He doesn't think that, you know, any of this is true. And basically, he says that it wasn't Ned's way, and Solis regrets not giving Stannis a son, and Melisandre interrupts and says she needs to serve her lord. And Jon signs requests for men that Sam is sending out to every house that they can, and Jon sees one written to Roose Bolton, of course, you know, um... Theon's, um, you know, well, that, that of course, Roos is, uh, what, what's his name? Now, I can't think of his name now, but basically, he refuses to sign it, and basically, Sam talks him into it, though John isn't happy about it, and Sam is leaving as Melisandre walks in, and Melisandre offers to bring John back home to Winterfell, but John says his home is Castle Black. And I was wondering if Melisandre was actually, if he was actually going to do it. But Melisandre says the only true war is life versus death. And I think that's a great line, honestly, because really it is. I mean, the time that they're in, yeah, it is kind of like life versus death. I mean, people die, they go to war. When there's not, you know, when there's life, you're not really at war. When there's death, you pretty much are at war. So I thought that was a really good line. So she wants to show John something. John assumes it's the vision of the fire from magic, but she says it's only life. She opens the front of her dress and places John's hand on her breast asking if he, if you can feel her heart beating and she encourages him to embrace the power within him he pulls away but melisandre straddles him and john says he doesn't think stannis would like this very much and melisandre says not to tell stannis then he doesn't really you know she doesn't really care and john remembers Ygritte saying that he still loves her and stops melisandre and i thought that was definitely really well done i knew he'd see Ygritte when she did that and Melisandre walks away, but turns in the doorway and says, you know nothing, John, and she's like, you know nothing, Jon Snow, and I'm wondering if Jon is going to tell Stance about this, because him and Stance are like that right now, you know, they're they're so tight, like, I definitely feel like he is going to tell Stannis what's going on here, I don't think he wouldn't tell Stannis, so... Shireen enters her father's quarters, and Shireen tells Stance that Solis told her she didn't want to bring her, and Shireen asks if Stance is ashamed of her, and basically... Um, Stannis tells the story of a Dornish trader who landed at Dragonstone, and every, everything he had was junk except a doll with Stannis' house colors on it, and Shireen loved the doll, but it carried the grayscale, and now we know how she got the grayscale, and I thought that was a really well done scene, because now we know how Shireen got, got this grayscale, was because of this doll, and... Everyone told Stance to send Shireen to live with the stone men, but he refused because he wanted her to have a normal life. And as bad as Stannis is, as much as I don't really like, you know, as much as I don't really trust Stannis, I thought that was really good because we see that, you know, he really wanted Shireen to have a happy life. And he refused and called in every maester and resource he could to stop this girl from spraying and basically save his daughter because he wanted to save his daughter. She, of course, is his daughter and he loves her. He wanted to give her a good life. And I thought that was good, but... 
She's pretty much now feared by everyone, and I thought that was just a really well done scene. Little things like that I definitely really enjoyed, and I thought that was really great. So Sansa lights candles in the crypt and beneath Winterfell. She finds a feather near the tomb of Lyanna, and then Littlefinger finds her there, and Sansa says her father never talked about Lyanna, and Littlefinger remembers seeing her once at the tournament, and Rhaegar Targaryen won. Everyone cheered until Rhaegar rode right past his wife, Ella Martell, to give a crown of winter roses to Lyanna, and Littlefinger wonders how many died because Rhaegar chose Lyanna, and Sansa reminds him that she was kidnapped and raped, and Littlefinger tells tells Sansa that he's planning on going to King's Landing, and he doesn't want to be left with the Boltons, and Littlefinger, now, I was like, okay, this is a good thing, because, you know, Sansa doesn't realize that Tyrion's gone, and if she goes back to King's Landing, she could be reunited with Tyrion, but, you know, it doesn't seem like she really cares, so I'm not sure if Sansa does care, um, but that is her husband, so... Basically, he says, Stance will march on King's Landing before winter comes. We must take Winterfell first. And I thought that was awesome because he knows the Stance is coming after um, the crown. He knows he wants to get that crown. And he now says he must take Winterfell first. And Littlefinger believes Stannis will succeed and rescue Sansa and name her Wardness of the North if that doesn't pan out. So basically, if that doesn't pan out, Sansa should take Ramsay and make the boy her own. And of course, we know that she doesn't really want to be with Ramsay right now, but she really is not going to have a choice because either that or Stance is going to take the crown. So Littlefinger kisses Sansa on the lips and tells her the North will be hers, and Sansa says she expects she'll be a married woman by the time Littlefinger returns. So it looks like she's going to go through with this marriage to Ramsay, whether... Um, whether, you know, whether um, Jon Snow wants her to or not, she's going to go through with it. So it's going to be, you know, she's going to go against her brother's word and go, you know, what her cousin's telling her to do, which I think is actually really interesting. I mean, she is definitely closer with Littlefinger than she is with Jon, so I can understand that. So Bronn rows himself and Jamie to shore. The next morning, Jamie wakes up to Bronn killing a snake and basically writes beside his head. And they eat it for breakfast, and Bronn says he wants to die in a boring way in his own keep while his kids fight over his fortune. And Jamie says he wants to die in the arms of the woman he loves. And Bronn says that if that woman wants the same thing, Bronn wonders what's to stop the caption of the ship they were on from telling Dorne that they're there, just as several um, Dornish riders show up, and the riders surround them, and Bronn makes up the story with fake names, and the riders still demand that Bronn and Jamie throw their swords in the sand, and Bronn feigns compliance, then attacks with a dagger, and they fight, and Jamie doing so awkwardly with his ha one hand, and we remember that Jamie does have one hand, but manages to stop a killing blow with his gold hand and land a counter strike, and they take the Dornish horses to make for the water gardens. And I thought something bad was going to happen in that scene. I thought something bad was going to happen possibly Jamie or Braun, but no, nothing bad happened, which was awesome. So it really shows how strong they are. So Elariah meets with the Sand Snakes, and Elariah tells them that Doran will not go to war and that they'll have to get revenge themselves. And the Sand, the sand Snakes have the captain from Jamie's boat. They realize that Jamie is here for Marcella and that it is now a race to take her revenge. And Obara, knowing this, decides to kill the captain. So the Sand Snakes are definitely going to go after Jamie, which I think is really interesting. And it seems like pretty much everyone's after the Lannisters at this point. I mean, the, you know, they're after the Lannisters. Um, you know, Brienne's going after the Lannisters. A lot of people are after the Lannisters. Um, my thinking here is, how is Jamie going to react to knowing that Brienne is coming after the Lannisters? Because obviously we know that she wants to, and I think that's really interesting overall. She does want to come after the Lannisters, but... Um, Actually, no, she doesn't want to come after them. Um, you know, um, Stan Stannis wants to come after the Lannisters, obviously. You know, um, Brienne wants to kill Stannis. Sorry, that that's what I meant. That Brienne wants to kill Stannis, and meanwhile, the Stan Snakes are coming after the Lannisters, which I think is really interesting. So, Jorhaz at sail with Tyrion, and Tyrion finally annoys Jorhaz enough that Jorhaz. Now, I've, I actually forgot this scene. Um, so, there is another scene with Tyrion. So, basically, Tyrion finally annoys Jorhaz enough that Jorhaz takes the gag out from Tyrion's mouth, and Tyrion asks who Jorhaz is and if he has wine, but Jorhaz remains cold and unhelpful, and Tyrion tells Jorhaz he's going the wrong way to get to Westeros, and Jorhaz tells him he's sailing to Daenerys, not Cersei, and Tyrion laughs as he was heading to Daenerys anyway, and Tyrion pieces together who Jorhaz is and wonders why Jorhaz was running from Daenerys. And Tyrion remembers that Jorha was spying on Daenerys for Varys, and that Daenerys must have found out and exiled him. And, you know, that that's the truth. That is what happened. So Tyrion warns that Jorha's plan to win back favor might backfire, but Jorha just hits him. And it looks like they're going to go along with this plan anyway, even though he doesn't really want to. 
So Daenerys overlooks Mirren from the Great Pyramid, and Selmy recalls a story of Daenerys' brother singing in the streets of King's Landing. Dario interrupts to tell her his dar is weighing the audience chamber with 50 or 100 others, and his dar continues to argue for the opening of the fighting pits as a traditional start of the fighting season, and his dar warns that these traditions are that holds the city together. The sons of the harpy move forward through the city, and this scene was insane, I have to say. Honestly, they treat the scene as intense as, like, the Red Wedding, which it was awesome. They find some of Daenerys' men, they just kill them. A prostitute tricks the Unsullied into falling and into a trap set by the sons. The two sides fight, and Selmy's in the street, and hears the panic. He pulls his sword, heads towards it. Grey Worm stabbed in the skirmish, but fights on. Grey Worm is the last Unsullied standing, surrounded by sons of the harpy, and Selmy shows up and joins the fight, taking down many of the remaining sons before he's overwhelmed and Grey Worm kills the last of them falls unconscious next to Selmy in the street and Daenerys is now going to be pissed because the sons of Anne Harpy the sons of the Harpy are now killing her people so I thought that was an amazing way to end the episode and uh that was just crazy so definitely that was insane we saw and uh, I really don't know what's going to happen, you know, with Daenerys' plot. But there's a lot to talk about, definitely. How is Daenerys going to react to the Sons of the Harpy attack? I don't think she's going to be happy. I think she's going to try to get them executed. Definitely, I think that's where we're heading with that. I think that's really interesting overall. Um, the Sand Snakes are definitely coming after Jamie. I kind of feel like Jamie's in danger of dying this season. I definitely feel like that's going to happen. Is Jamie going to die? I definitely could see that possibly happening, but I guess we'll have to see. Um, Jorha and Tyrion, is this whole plan gonna work? I really don't know if this is gonna work. I guess we'll have to see what happens there. Um, John, is John really gonna tell, uh, you know, Stannis about what Melisandre did? I don't think he'd really keep that from Stannis. I don't think he would. I think that he, you know, nothing happened. He can't say that anything happened because nothing happened. She was the one that put the moves on him, and I think Stannis wouldn't be upset about it. But I think that John, knowing John, how loyal he is to Stannis, I think he will tell Stannis about it, and we'll see what happens there. I love the reveal with Stannis and Shireen. I think that was really well done. Definitely something I love seeing was that scene between the two of them. Um, as far as Sansa and Littlefinger, it seems like Sansa's getting married. Is Lil Jon Snow going to stop it? Is this wedding going to be successful? Is it going to turn out like the wed running god? I hope not. I don't want another one of those. But I feel like definitely, because of the way this episode ended, I feel like we're headed towards war. I mean, we saw in the promo, they said winter is coming. So shit's going to go down, definitely. Uh, Tommen, is this, is his whole thing with, you know, him not being as good as a king, is he gonna ruin stuff with Marjorie? I really hope he doesn't, because I like, um, Tommen and Marjorie, and I hope he doesn't ruin things with her, but the direction that his character's head, I definitely feel like that's what's gonna happen, he's gonna end up ruining things with Marjorie, and I really hope he doesn't, but I guess we'll have to see what ends up happening there. And I guess that's really all I need to talk about. Also, is the whole thing with the High Sparrow, is he going to be able to become the High Septon? Is this going to work like Cersei wants it to? But that's basically my review. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you guys saw this episode. Overall, guys, I thought this was another great episode. Absolutely loved this episode. Loving this season. And I will see you guys in my next video, which will be my review for tonight's episode of Mad Men. So I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.